So in this lecture, what we want to do is do a few examples of current density and then look at Ohm's law and then look at series circuits. Okay. So <clears throat> remember that current density J is in principle just simply the current divided by the cross-sectional area of a given wire that the current is flowing through. Okay. Now, um, there's a more general way to th think about current density when we get up into um, more sophisticated types of physics with, you know, for example, like particle accelerators and things. Because in those cases, the particles that you're smashing in, you know, like the sophisticated atom smashers aren't traveling through wires um, the same way that current is traveling through wires in your everyday circuitry devices. Um, and a lot of times those beams are in air, but the particles are still charged and so there's still current, so there's still a current density. But for our purposes, um, we're going to restrict our conversations to what happens when the um, current is flowing in um, wires, okay? And um, so, for example, if I let's let's suppose that my current is equal to um, say half an amp, okay? And um, I have a radius of say 0.5 millimeters. Okay, what is the current density in this particular wire? All right, so basically if I snip my wire and measure the um, radius of my wire, I would get half of a millimeter and if I have half of an amp running through that wire, I want to know what the current density is. Now, before we get going, one thing should be noted, a lot of times current densities are going to be very large, okay, compared to the actual value of the current. And that's because the current density is measured over an area, and in SI units anyway, the area is going to be measured over meters squared. And my wires are typically fractions of a centimeter or even fractions of a millimeter in terms of uh, radius. And so I can fit, if I had a square meter, I could fit hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of wires of that type in a box um, with an area of one square meter. So our current densities, we shouldn't be surprised when our current densities have um, very high values compared to the actual current flowing through the circuit. So current density in this case, now we're just looking at the magnitude, right? Remember technically the current density is a vector and the area has a vector that points outward or inward, but it is normal to the surface, right? So we'll, we'll let the unit vector uh, be into the cross-sectional area in the same direction as the uh, current that we have um, uh, drawn here. So this is the unit vector of my area, okay? Um, and so, if, if we have a coordinate system and just let this be in the x direction, 
then this is just I hat. Okay, so my the, the vector nature is wrapped up right there, but the value or the magnitude is wrapped up here in that calculation. Okay, so if we have 0.5 amps and our area, remember, is going to be pi times r squared, so this is going to be pi times 0.5 millimeters squared which is the same thing as 0.5 amps um, and this would be pi and if we convert 0.5 millimeters to meters it's the same thing as 5 times 10 to the negative 4 meters squared and um, at that point this is just a number I'm not going to take the time to calculate that out you can calculate that out um, but it's going to be a very large number right um, it's going to be on the order of something say times 10 to the um, seventh or eighth okay it might be to the sixth depending on how the coefficients work out um, but it'll be something on the order of close to times 10 to the seventh. Okay. We'll put roughly here. Okay. Um, and so what that means is you've got a lot of current that could or, or, or another way of thinking about this may be better than, than what I was just about to say. If you had a wire that was one meter squared in cross-sectional area, right, then it would be carrying a current of roughly 10 to the 7 amps if it had this same current density that our small wire here does. Okay, that's what this means, right? Um, and this is amps per square meter, right? So that gives you an idea, or hopefully gives you an idea of, of current density and how to calculate it. Um, you also have, remember, the current density form here, but we don't usually use this form. now. Oftentimes, you can either calculate the electric field or you'll be given the electric field that's established inside the wire as a result of, of, of a potential difference, but we don't often use the conductivity. We, we simply don't use the conductivity all that often in our calculations. So this form is usually not um, what you would use to calculate the current density the current per unit area is more often going to be uh, what's used. Okay, um, so back to Ohm's law, we established in the last video that Ohm's law gives us a relationship between the potential difference across a section of a conductor the current in that conductor and the resistance of that conductor okay now one thing to note is that in um, regular circuits okay the kind of circuits that we're going to look at you have to have a complete path no current will flow your current needs a complete path no current will flow if you don't have a complete path okay you have to have a complete path over which the potential difference to act 
if you don't have a complete path you have a uh, break in your circuit sometimes called a short in your circuit actually it's not a short that's a that's a different thing um, but you have a break in your path and no current will flow so if we go back to the uh, circuit diagram notation that we introduced remember that we will often denote a battery or a source of potential difference like this and when you do this you're assuming that this is the positive terminal of your battery and this is the negative terminal of your battery now I should mention one thing okay I should mention one thing if I just hook two wires to the two ends of my battery and just let them stretch out okay and I don't complete them I don't hook them together what is happening if if these are pure conductors okay and and over very short distances you know the less than a meter especially um, a copper wire a typical copper wire is a nearly perfect conductor okay um, once you get you know several meters or longer then the impurities in the copper uh, add to the total resistivity of the copper um, and 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 things become a little bit more um, uh, resistive but over very short distances a few centimeters the kind of circuits that we're gonna build uh, for those in the lab um, over very short distances a copper wire is essentially a perfect conductor and if you hook a piece of wire to one end of your battery terminal and the other end of your battery terminal then this end of your wire is held at the same positive potential and this end of your wire is held at the same negative end of your potential so whatever the potential difference across your uh, battery is will be the same potential difference across the entire configuration here okay so these two potential differences are equal so batteries come in a variety of uh, values um, the base value is often going to be 1.5 volts but we have um, for example triple uh, A batteries and double A batteries that are most often in um, 1.5 volt uh, values. Um, C batteries can often come in the same um, form, 1.5 volts. You can have six volt batteries that often look something like this um, that you can buy from you know places like Walmart or Target or whatever, or hardware stores. Um, car batteries are typically 12 volt batteries um, some larger car batteries can be 24 volts and so on um, and so the 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 voltages will often be in uh, multiples of three uh, and it's because usually the base voltage of a, of a small battery is 1.5 volts um, and so whatever your voltage of your battery is will be the same voltage that you measure across a configuration like this but no current is flowing because there's no complete path now again if I stick another wire like this okay and now I measure the potential difference across these two points I will still also measure the same potential of the battery okay again as long as these are pure conductors and even to the point where we put more wires in here I will still be measuring the potential difference of the battery across these two points okay 
And so when I put something like a resistor in here, that resistor, the ends of the resistor, now also feel the same potential. So I have a positive potential over here, I have a negative potential over here, and their potential difference across the resistor is the same as the potential difference across the battery. This leads to an important conclusion that will play a very important role um, in later uh, considerations with circuits, and that is energy conservation. Okay, um, Potential difference is energy per unit charge. And so for energy to be conserved, or for energy to not dam up somewhere in the circuit as current is flowing, the um, total potential difference that appears across your elements, like your resistors, have to add up to whatever source you have in terms of your battery, especially when you have just a single loop like this. We'll talk about more sophisticated loops um, down the road, but when you have a single loop like this, whatever your source is must be the same voltage as the um, elements added up. Okay, So the voltage that appears across the resistor must be the same as the voltage across the battery. Okay, um, So with that in mind, let's just throw in some numbers. Let's say I have a six volt battery and let's say I have a 12 ohm resistor and I want to calculate the current. Okay, In that case, the current from Ohm's law and oftentimes we'll drop the delta and just let V be the potential difference and understand that it's a difference. Um, and so V is equal to IR, so I is equal to V over R. And um, whoops, that will be six volts divided by 12 ohms. And this is going to then give 0.5 amps, okay? So for single element circuits where your element is just a simple resistor, Ohm's law is very simple to apply, right? If you know two of the three quantities, you can get the third. Um, but when you have multiple elements in a given circuit, things get a little bit more complicated. And that is where the idea of series and parallel circuits come in. And we will start with the series case. So uh, the series circuit is when you have multiple resistors in a single loop. Okay, multiple resistors in a single loop. Um, in that case, so let's for example, say we have a circuit that looks like this. And let's call this resistor one, let's call this resistor two. Here's my potential uh, source and we have our plus terminal and our minus terminal and I want to know what the current if I were to measure the current with an ammeter okay what current would I measure okay so we'll talk about this from a theoretical point of view first and then we'll actually do some numbers but when you have a single loop, and what we mean by loop is just a single path. So when I have just one path for my current to flow through, and by the way, 
we define the direction of current to be the direction positive charge would flow. Um, this is a historical artifact from Ben Franklin. Um, he had a 50-50 chance of, of getting the um, charge that was uh, more easily moved correct, and he picked wrong. So when he was investigating charge, and he labels charge positive and negative, uh, it was then discovered that it was more likely that one type of charge was the uh, mover that caused electricity, and um, they didn't know which type it was, and he picked the positive, and of course we identify positive with protons, and protons are usually held more tightly in uh, atomic nuclei, which are held in uh, lattice forms, particularly in your conductors, and it's the free electrons that move. So in truth, the actual moving charges are moving opposite the direction of the current that we define. But we typically define current as leaving the positive terminal of a battery and entering the negative terminal of the battery, even though it is actually the opposite way. Okay. So usually we define current to be leaving the positive terminal going to the negative in fact, the electrons would flow in the opposite direction. Um, but, so, how do we analyze this situation? So, what we do is we say, okay, from the battery's perspective, all the battery knows, okay, is that it's pushing out some current this way, and that same amount of current is coming in this way, and the battery knows it has a potential V. And so all the battery knows is that there's some total resistance out here. And that total resistance has to follow Ohm's law. So from the perspective of the battery, V is equal to IR where R is that total value of the resistance, okay? Um, and one of the rules for circuits is that in a single loop, the current must be the same everywhere. And this is a conservation of charge principle, okay? So the fact that your uh, elements, the voltage across your resistors has to add up to the voltage across the battery is a statement of conservation of energy. The statement that the current has to be the same everywhere in a, if you have a single loop um, is a statement of the conservation of charge. So charge can't leak somewhere or, or dissipate somewhere or dam up somewhere. So it's, it's not like in a single loop like this, you'll have more charge leaving the battery on this end, and then the charge gets lost somewhere in here and you have fewer charges entering the battery. That doesn't happen. So in a single loop, the current must be the same everywhere. So what that means or allows us to say is that no matter where you measure the current, it doesn't matter where you put your ammeter. You can put it uh, here, where the current would be entering the battery. You can put it here, where the current is leaving the battery. You can put your ammeter here in between the two resistors. It doesn't matter. You should measure the same current. So in this case, the current is the same no matter where you go. And this is the voltage of the battery. So this is Ohm's law applied to the circuit as a whole. Okay, and we can find, if we know, 
what the battery voltage is because we can read that off or we can measure it with a voltmeter. We can measure the current with the ammeter so we can then calculate what the uh, resistance the battery is seeing out here, right? So if I were to connect this into one um, circuit, the whatever this total resistance is that the battery thinks is out there, um, I can calculate what that total resistance ought to be, okay? Um, so our total would just be the voltage of the battery divided by the voltage or the the current divided by the current okay so with that in mind um because we also have the rule that the voltage across the individual loops, and I'll redraw my circuit over here since that one's getting a little bit busy. Okay. We also have the rule we've already discussed that whatever the voltage of my battery is, the voltage across each of my elements so if this is R1 let's label the voltage across this resistor V1 this would be the plus side this would be the minus side and then this would be the plus side and this would be the minus side of this resistor we also have the rule that the total voltage used by the elements must add up to the source. Okay? So again, this is just conservation of energy. This is conservation of charge. This is conservation of energy. And because the current has to be the same everywhere, I have the same amount of current um, moving through this resistor as I have moving through this resistor, okay? Ohm's law can be applied to the circuit as a whole, but it can also be applied to each individual element. So this is where we uh, are able to actually analyze what's going on in series circuits. Uh, Ohm's law is applicable to the circuit as a whole, but it's also applicable to each individual resistor because each individual resistor has a given voltage that we can measure across uh, it. It has a resistance and it has a current. So we can say that V1, or the voltage across the first resistor, is equal to the current through the resistor times its uh, resistance. And the same thing would hold for the second resistor. OK? And so by the statement of conservation of energy, by the statement of conservation of energy, we can say that the voltage of the battery must equal the voltage across the first resistor plus the voltage across the second resistor. So basically what this is saying is, uh, voltage is energy per unit charge. So however many charges the battery is pushing per unit time, you can calculate how much energy per unit time then the battery is pushing or the battery is supplying. And then that energy is used up in each of the resistors and they're used in such a way that however much is used across the first resistor, whatever's left is then used across the second resistor. And then the charges that have depleted all of their 
uh, potential energy get sent back to the battery and the cycle repeats. Okay, this is a this is a simple way of looking at uh, what's going on in a circuit like this. So the conservation of energy implies that the total energy supplied by the battery has to be used up across the two elements. But I can apply Ohm's law to each of these. So I have Ohm's law for the battery, which implies current times the effective total resistance that the battery thinks is there is going to be equal to I uh, times the first resistor plus I times the second resistor from these two equations. And because the current has to be the same everywhere from that statement, the current can cancel out and I reach the conclusion that in a series circuit, the total resistance just turns out to be the sum of the individual resistors. Okay? In a series circuit, the total resistance just turns out to be the sum of your series resistors. And so, what that means is, if we want to do an explicit example here, okay? Let's say I have a 12 volt battery, and a lot of our examples I'll, I'll use 12 volts. I have a 12 volt battery, and let's say I have a 6 ohm resistor and a 6 ohm resistor. Okay, now there are several questions I can ask based on the information from this slide. Okay, based on the information from that slide, there are lots of questions I can ask. The first and most obvious question is what is the total current in the circuit? And I, I shouldn't even say what is the total current because the current's just going to be the same everywhere. Um, and so, one of the other questions I can ask is what is the voltage across the first resistor? And we'll label this R1, we'll label this R2, and C what is the voltage across the second resistor. So let us look at this in a little bit more detail. And first things first, let's calculate what the current would be, what our ammeter would measure if we measured it. Um, and to do that, remember that the total resistance is just the sum of the individual resistors. And that result would hold no matter how many resistors I put in this loop, okay? You would just keep adding them up, right? Um, and so my total resistance I know is gonna be six ohms plus six ohms. So my total resistance is 12 ohms. So my current is going to be 12 volts divided by 12 ohms or one amp. So I'm gonna measure one amp in this particular circuit, okay? Now, what about the voltages across the individual components? Well, we can find the voltages across the individual components from these equations right here, right? So we're going to have V1 is equal to um, I times R1 or 1 amp times uh, 6 ohms, which is going to give me 6 volts. V2 is going to be I times R1, which is going to be 1 amp, also times 6 ohms, which is also 6 volts. And so you can see that the voltage across 
the first resistor plus the voltage across the second resistor add up to the voltage across the battery as we claimed it should. And it shouldn't be surprising that since these resistors are equal that they use an equal amount of potential. Um, what if they were different, right? What if they were different? Okay, so let me let me do the let me do the hard theoretical way to do this first, and then we'll we'll discuss why it is the way it is. So you can derive, it takes a little doing, but you can derive a simple formula for what the voltage ought to be across any given uh, circuit element if you know the total resistance in the circuit. And here's how. Remember that I was calculated from the voltage of the battery divided by the total resistance. Okay, so I is V bat divided by R total. Okay, so V1 is the voltage of the battery divided by the total resistance times R1. Okay, that's this ex expression expanded out. So another way of writing this is the voltage of the battery times the ratio of the resistor to the total resistance. So if you know what fraction of the total resistance the first resistor has, you can then multiply that ratio by the voltage of the battery and you can get the voltage across that element. So for example, what if we had a um, 24? Uh, let's not use 24 actually. Uh, let's see, what will be a good, let's use 18. What if I have an 18? ohm resistor for R1 and a 6 ohm resistor for R2. Now our total resistance is going to be 18 plus 6 ohms is 24 ohms. So my total, uh, my current is now not uh, 1 amp, it's half an amp. Okay, so um, if I measure my current with an ammeter, I'll get half an amp. But the point here is that if I want to measure the voltage across the first resistor, this is going to be the voltage of the battery, 12 volts, times R1, which is 18 ohms, divided by 24. and the ohms cancel out. And so 18 divided by 24 is 3 fourths, right? 18 divided by 24 is 3 fourths. And 3 fourths times 12 should be nine. So nine volts will appear across the first resistor now. So when I measure the voltage using a voltmeter, across this first resistor, I would measure that to be nine volts. And across the second resistor, if I measured that with a voltmeter, I would measure that to be three volts. And we can, uh, we can see that two different ways or three different ways really we can we can get v2 directly from this expression which we now know that this is half an amp 
so 0.5 amps times 6 is 3 volts. Or um, you can use a similar expression as we said from here for uh, V2. V2 will also be equal to V battery times uh, R2 over the total resistance. So this is 12 times 3, uh, or, uh, 6 over 24. And once again, ohms cancel out. And so 6 over 24 is 1 fourth, and um, 1 fourth times 12 is 3. So no matter how you slice, uh, or another way you can get it is from uh, V battery equals V1 plus V2. So V2 must be V battery minus V1, which is 12 minus 9 volts or 3 volts. So no matter how you slice it, you can calculate what the voltage across the third or, or the second uh, resistor ought to be uh, using a myriad of um, processes. It doesn't matter how you do it. Okay. I recommend in general um, becoming familiar with this process because it can save you a lot of time. If you understand that the um, value of a the voltage across a resistor can be found by the uh, ratio of the value of that resistor to the total resistance and then just multiply that ratio by the voltage source, um, you can get what the voltage across that resistor ought to be. So, um, lesson learned is that when you have resistors in series, the larger the resistor will draw or, or will use more of the available potential. Okay. The larger the resistor will use more of the available potential. There's one last concept to introduce here, and that is the issue of power. Okay, So this is actually um, what we're often very interested in. Okay, Because when you buy circuit elements from the store, namely things like light bulbs that you plug into your outlets, light bulbs are generally measured in watts and watts is the unit of power. So remember that power is energy per unit time. Okay, Remember that power is energy per unit time. But remember also that voltage is energy per unit charge and current is charge per unit time. So if I multiply V and I, I get energy per unit charge times charge per unit time and my charges cancel out and I get energy per unit time. So knowing the potential across a circuit element and the current through that circuit element, I can get the amount of power that is being delivered to that circuit element. Okay, I can, I can get the power that's being delivered to that circuit element. Now, um, the circuit element uses the energy supplied by the battery. The, the electrons don't keep the energy. Okay, The electrons don't keep the energy. If they kept the energy, then they would supply energy back to the battery um, when they completed their loop through the circuit, 
and the energy would uh, or the battery would be gaining energy it would almost be like the battery would be building itself and that doesn't happen so what happens when you have current that moves through the circuit and hits an element like a resistor that uses the energy right so you supply energy from the battery the resistor uses the energy with the same potential difference in, in just a single uh, resistor loop. And so what, what's happening is we say that the resistor dissipates that power. Okay. Now, what I've told you uh, the the energy being supplied to the charges and the charges flowing to the resistor and uh, giving the resistor um, their energy is a simplistic view to introduce you to how Ohm's law operates in these circuits. We will find, however, shortly within just a few chapters that that particular visualization is not entirely correct, right? What we will find is that the energy is actually transported in the electric and the magnetic fields, right? But for the moment, you can think of the electrons uh, gaining energy from the battery and um, moving through the circuit as I've explained, but what we will actually find is that the actual way that the energy is transported is through the um, generation and propagation of the electric and magnetic fields. Um, it the, the charges actually just move as a consequence of the fact that they're free to move um, in the electric field, in, in the uh, presence of the electric field, but it's actually the electric fields and the magnetic fields that propagate the energy. And the resistors then take that energy supplied by those fields and dissipate them. In the case of the light bulb, the light bulb lights up and the power is radiated out into your room via light. So your resistor, if you just have a regular resistor in a circuit um, that doesn't light up, then it will usually dissipate the power in terms of heat. Okay, the, the power is dissipated by the resistor in terms of heat. And once again, the electrons don't retain that energy that they got from the battery or else the battery would be gaining energy every time the electrons came in. And remember, the electrons are given potential energy, okay? Not kinetic. Now, they're given kinetic by the electric field, so they're able to move, and they do have some kinetic energy as a result of that, but the energy conservation between the battery and the resistor is a conservation of potential. And if we extend this idea of the power being equal to the voltage times the uh, current through a resistor, we can now go back to the example that we had here and we can calculate the power through each of these resistors. Okay, so if I want to calculate the power through resistor 1, we know that the current was half of an amp. So the power through resistor 1 is VI, and so this will be the, the voltage across the first resistor. And so this is going to be 9 volts times 0.5 amps. 
and so this is 4.5 watts okay the power through resistor 2 is going to be equal to the second resistor times the current and the second resistor had 3 volts times 0.5 amps and 3 uh, times 0.5 is 1.5 okay so now watch what happens if I calculate the power through the battery the power through the battery is going to be equal to the voltage of the battery I, I shouldn't say the power through the battery I should say the power delivered by the battery uh, is equal to the voltage of the battery times the current and this is going to be 12 volts times 0.5 amps and that equals 6 watts this shouldn't be a surprise the total power used or dissipated by each of the resistors added up is the voltage or the power delivered by the battery okay so whatever power is dissipated by your resistors is the power that's delivered by your battery in the series circuit okay so there you have it, uh, a little bit about series circuits and a little bit about the power in those circuits and applications of Ohm's Law. And in the next one, we will talk about parallel circuits. So we will see you next time.